welcome back to Sweet Stories in the Dell. My name is Caperton Morton. I'm a Sweet Bar alum, and I produce this podcast in collaboration with the college. This is part one of episode five, Researching the Palimpsest of Sweet Bar's History. So, Palimpsest, P-A-L-I-M-P-S-E-S-T, Palimpsest. One of its meanings is something having usually diverse layers, which perfectly describes Sweetbriar College and its complicated history. Revealed in our layers are multitudes of human beings who have helped make and continue to make our existence as a college possible at all. And at this time, I'm referring to the employees behind the scenes at Sweetbriar, who make everyday life run more efficiently for those in academics and administration and for our students as well. These individuals work in food services, housekeeping, buildings and grounds, the post office, and in other areas, too. And in the last 20 years, there's been a keen interest in the ancestral connections that many of our support employees have with the individuals who were, in essence, our invisible founders. This term, invisible founder, signifies the importance of these individuals to Sweetbar's history. It also acknowledges the college's prior incarnation as Sweetbriar Plantation, Sweetbriar one word ending in ER. And though the connections to slavery are nothing to be proud of, acknowledging them is necessary to fully understand how we got to where we are now as a nation, a state, and a college. In 1830, Elijah Fletcher purchased 1,000 acres with a two-story red brick home named Locust Grove. After the purchase, the plantation was renamed for the wild sweetbriar rose that still grows on the property. In regard to slavery, the census of 1830 shows that Elijah Fletcher owned 12 enslaved individuals. But after making sweetbriar the family's permanent residence in 1841, those numbers grew substantially. And by 1858, the will of Elijah Fletcher lists 155 enslaved individuals at Sweetbriar. I'll cite the source for these figures later. By 1860, the eldest of Elijah's four surviving children, Indiana Fletcher, had become Sweetbriar's sole owner. Miss Cindy changed the spelling of the plantation name to Sweetbriar two words, Briar ending in A-R. And then in 1865, Miss Indy married James Henry Williams, and two years later, their daughter Daisy was born. After the Civil War, many of those formerly enslaved individuals stayed on at Sweetbriar as paid hourly workers, continuing the daily care of the family and the maintenance of the farm. Miss Indy died in 1900, and the following year, Sweetbriar College was founded as directed by her will. In fact, many of our invisible founders helped build the college. There's so much more to discover about our invisible founders and their descendants. Fortunately, our students are continuing this important research into Sweetbar's history. In particular, a course called History Detectives guides students as they make their own dive into historical research. Dr. Dewana Waugh, Assistant Professor of History, is one of the professors who teaches this course. And in the fall of 2020, this class initiated profound personal discoveries for one of her students. You'll meet the student later on, but first I introduce Dr. Dewana Waugh. And just a heads up, you'll hear the sound of cicadas in the background. I'm Dewana Wall. I'm an assistant professor of history here at Sweetbriar College. I'm a native Virginian from Lynchburg, born and raised. I study 20th century, 21st century history. I'm really interested in educational history, um, social justice history, do a lot of oral history work, uh, public history work, and largely looking at social movements and how they develop and the consequences and outcomes of those. Duana graduated from Randolph-Macon Women's College in Lynchburg, Virginia. Since then, it's become a co-educational institution renamed Randolph College. I 
absolutely loved going to a woman's college and it wasn't an intentional choice when I applied uh, at Randolph-Macon. My sister had gone there and I had gotten a scholarship and so it was kind of a, you know, no-brainer. <laughs> That's where you're going. And I, I have no regrets. In my four years there, it was a, a sisterhood, a rich experience. Classes were small where you could have really interesting, frank conversations. And I think it's a wonderful asset to have women's colleges. Dwana was a history major and a psychology minor. Plus, she got her teaching license in secondary education. I was a true liberal arts nut. I had a lot of eclectic tastes, and I actually could have graduated in three years, so I had enough credits, but I chose to go the education path, which, of course, I had to stay to be able to student teach. And I had a really awesome professor, so shout out to John Don Tremont. I took so many of my classes with him as the U.S. historian. And I thought, I want to be just like my professors, and I want to, I want to teach in an environment just like that. So the opportunity to work at Sweetbriar, working with students to help build young women into the people that they're going to become in the world, to be a force in the world, was really intriguing. The professors are wholly invested in seeing the students succeed. For a couple of years after graduation, Twana taught history at a magnet high school in Newport News, Virginia. She then moved on to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where she received both her master's and doctorate degrees. Then, in the fall of 2018, she was one of the first two faculty members hired by President Wu. And the fact is that Dwana is the only black faculty member at Sweetbriar. She and I discussed this later on. On a Zoom call in January of 2021, Dwana and I continue our discussion. I ask about the challenges that a small history program faces and ask about the benefits, too. Considering the size of Sweetbriar, we can be limited on what we can offer. So while we may want to have some more specific courses, it can be more of a challenge because there are certain classes that have to be taught and we're not able to stretch as far as we may like if it were a larger department. But on the positive side, you know, given the size of Sweetbriar, in addition to the size of the faculty, students are able to do one-on-one research projects in a way that may not be as accessible in larger departments. That would be an attribute, particularly for students who are interested in doing one-on-one research projects with faculty members to really deepen knowledge. And so in that way, While you can't do the breadth in terms of teaching of courses, you can do more of the depth of learning about history through these one-on-one independent projects. Does the history program enhance other programs of study? History is one of those subjects that, you know, is nicely suited and can fit it in social sciences. You can fit it in humanities. From my undergraduate education, it was more humanities-focused A lot of students will complement a history major with political science. I see more students who may be a history major or a minor and a creative writing major. And I think the nice thing in terms of humanities, history tells stories. It's a way to think of the sweep of the past and integrate those into creative narratives that you might tell. In terms of political science, uh, history teaches you investigative skills of how to dig and, and look at evidence and weigh evidence and interrogate sources and look at how these bits of evidence can influence certain things like policies. In terms of philosophy, you think on that abstract level about the past and trying to put the puzzle pieces together. I asked Juana what sparked her passion for history and what she likes most about the study of history. I was a very inquisitive child, so I always asked a lot of questions about family history and those conversations with my grandfather, grandma, my parents really cemented an interest in history. And, you know, I attended church in Amherst County and 
remember going down 130, riding these country roads and just thinking about what was life like before you know these roads existed or what was life like 40 years before and you know, what were people listening to and what experiences did they have and I think with Sweetbriar it's the same type of sentiment that you know if you look at the landscape and you walk the landscape and you breathe in the air thinking about the generations of people over the past thousands of years who walked this very landscape gives you some pause to to think of the shared experience that you've all had on the same very land that your your feet reside on and i have come to really love history because it allows us to look at the things we've done in the past and how we can work to improve our future i love the fact that it gives you an opportunity to really investigate things and and be very inquisitive and ask tons of questions and you should be asking tons of questions about the world in which we live and how we have arrived at our current moment. I really like getting my hands on archival materials or finding, like you were talking about, weird finds in the attic or, you know, in a in a barn and, and coming across that and to think that someone decades earlier or centuries earlier also touched that is is always something that's fascinated me and it makes it more relevant more personal when you can see it through that prism you are able to craft stories and and learn about the world in in this broadest sense History is also one of those unique subjects that covers every discipline, right? Because everything has a history. So math has a history. Engineering has a history. History has its history, you know? It's so all-encompassing, and I love that. One of the history courses is History Detectives. It had a predecessor called Doing Sweetbriar History, Dr. Jerry Berg taught it as far back as the 1970s. And for the 2020 fall semester class, Dwana directed her students back towards the central question of what is the story of Sweet Bar College? Dwana divided the class into teams, focusing on time period groupings. As students looking at the landscape and we went out and walked the land and, you know, talked about the history that unfolded the slave cabin, slave cemetery, and just thinking about, you know, Monacan's impact on the land and um, the Invisible Founders' impact on the land. The Monacans who Dwana just mentioned are a fairly recently federally recognized tribe of indigenous people. Their ancestors lived agrarian lives in this region for over 10,000 years. And the Monacan Nation headquarters is not far from the college in Amherst County. And then looked at a lot of archival materials, and they had a lot of research days in the archives and looking at the Sweetbriar Museum. There's some some limitations on the availability of sources for some time periods, and others had a wealth of different sources that were available. So that was a bit of a challenge. Whereas before, if things were more opened up, we could go to the Amherst County Historical Museum through the county records and do a field trip for earlier periods of Sweetbriar's history. But what they ended up producing was well done. We talked initially about early Sweetbriar history and used Lynn Rainville's book, Invisible Founders, as a core text. Dr. Lynn Rainville, the author of Invisible Founders, has strong connections with the college, which will be explained shortly. Um, I think, as I mentioned, there was a student in the class that was a descendant of one of the Invisible Founders And so she was always amazed to come across their names in in the record. The name that Dwana's student came across was Nanny Cashwell Christian. Nanny was born around 1886, so 21 years after the Civil War. And as a young woman, she was Miss Indy's cook. And she had a lot of family connections to Sweetbriar a very prominent worker among the campus community. And so the student who is a descendant of hers, just trying to learn more and more about the stories that she remembered hearing, some things began to click for her. So that is always fascinating when you can personalize history. 
I'm thrilled to talk with Sweet Bar student Ashanti Brown, the great-great-granddaughter of Nanny Cashwell Christian. My name is Ashanti Brown. I'm a first year. I'm from Amherst, Virginia, and I'm a psychology major. So when I when I first saw the name, I was confused. Like I've heard it somewhere. So I went into my dad's room and I was like, do we know Nanny Cashwell Christian? Because I've heard that name before. And he was like, what were you talking about? I had to wait for him to wake up a little bit. And mind you, that was at two o'clock in the morning. And then he said, well, yeah, Nanny Cashwell Christian is your great, great grandmother. So the next day I went to class and I told Dr. Wall, I was like, Nanny Cashwell Christian in the book, that's my great, great grandmother. And as I kept reading, I was seeing more family members' names like Levi Johnson and started making more connections. So it was adding more onto the information that I already knew from the textbook and then finding out things for myself, different things that weren't in the textbook. We were all sitting in the living room, me, my dad, and my grandma, and I just brought up, can you show me where Signora Hollins is buried? Because I need it for a project. As a child, Signora Hollins was the playmate of Miss Cindy's daughter, Daisy. Signora also worked at the college for many years. My grandma, she hopped in the truck with us, and we all went around to different cemeteries, which sounds kind of weird, but we were like all looking forward, and my grandma's getting out of the truck and going in the woods and weeds and getting all scratched up. And I was just like, she's really involved in this. You know, it was, it was cool to see, like, my grandma talking about her childhood more and me getting to know more about what she went through. And then my dad also getting to add in his stories and talking about the people he knew. I'm usually very quiet, so, me, like, if we're all sitting there, I'm not really talking about much. So, like, to have those conversations with my grandma and to see her, like, light up at the names I was saying, and it was really, like, cool to get involved with that. How did what you found out, how did it affect you? It just made me feel more connected to the college because I always knew I had roots there. When I actually saw it for myself and like it actually connected to me, like even right now it's still connecting to me as I'm having this conversation. It was just like, I really have had people here before me working here and now I get to go here as a student and learn something that they might not have even been able to do. I'm honoring them at going here as a student and getting good grades and getting as involved as I can. Because I know my aunt had the chance to go to Sweetbriar, but they couldn't take the opportunity. So for me to be the first one to be able to go, it's affecting me every day as I go on to campus because I get to do what they couldn't. Now back to Dr. Waugh. I asked Juana what it means to her as a historian to have Sweetbriar's acknowledgement of its connection with slavery. That's very critical. Sweetbriar is unique because it was founded after the Civil War, you know, at the dawn of the 20th century. And <clears throat> that um, you might say, well, enslaved people have no connection. You know, this wasn't part of slavery with Sweetbriar because Sweetbriar was founded in 1901 and it opened in 1906 and, you know, there's not that connection. But I think it's really important as a historian to look backward and realize this was a functioning operating plantation where enslaved people worked and the descendants of these enslaved people who remain very committed to this land and very committed to this space in turn began to work for the college and helped to build buildings across the college and dig, you know, the lake and so on, um, that that is important to have that um, tie back to slavery in a way that is a little more concrete. That's the nitty gritty part of history is getting to these longer continuities or these moments of these, you know, peaks and markers of change that we can see across time. And it's only through digging and searching and investigating that you can really uncover those stories. I ask about the enslaved cemetery or the plantation burial ground. There began in the 21st century to be some acknowledgement of the space. Um, it must have been fall of 2018. Black Student Alliance, BSA, wanted to have a ceremony to come here. And so insert this early morning service into the Founders Day program. That was under President Wu's administration. 
Lynn Rainville, who was a former dean, she helped to uncover, you know, some of the graves here. I'm Dr. Lynn Rainville, and right now I'm the director of institutional history and the museums at Washington and Lee University. I started this position in 2019 after two decades as a public historian with a very deep commitment to helping people understand the relevance of the past to the present and what we can learn moving forward. Dr. Rainville is the author of the book Invisible Founders. It's the source for the census data that I cited earlier. Lynn had been hired to teach a semester at the University of Virginia. Then, in 2001, she was hired for a one-year opening at Sweetbriar in the Anthropology and Sociology departments, but she ended up staying for 18 years. After teaching several years, Lynn was appointed director of the Tusculum Institute, which was dedicated to historic preservation and public history. After another few years, she was appointed as the associate dean and then dean of the college. And that was the last position I had before I left in 2019 to come to Washington and Lee. My PhD training was in Near Eastern archaeology, so I spent 15 years working in Turkey and Syria. I was hired as an anthropological archaeologist, so I was being hired to teach classes on Mesopotamia, ancient Egypt. I mean, nothing to do with history, certainly not American history. So I started teaching at Sweetbriar in the fall of 01, in other words, right when 9-11 occurred. And so... Although I myself continued to work in the Middle East for years after that, it, it was pretty clear immediately in the, the months after 9-11 that it was going to be complicated to bring Sweetbriar students with me to the Middle East, um, that at the very least parents were probably going to be concerned about that. So I was looking for other hands-on opportunities to teach archaeology to students. My master's thesis was on historic New Hampshire cemeteries, so there was some continuity here in terms of my interests, but... It's only obviously in hindsight that this becomes, you know, a 20-year focus and continuing. Lynn's about to mention Monument Hill. It's the cemetery where the plantation owners were buried, including Sweet Bar College founder Miss Indy and her family. It's located on a hill that overlooks the hay and athletic fields with the main college campus in the distance. So, uh, you know, I was immediately drawn to Monument Hill, and again, as part of my own journey to understand, well, but on a southern plantation, it's not just the burial of the white family. Somewhere there must be burials of enslaved men, women, and children. And that's what started leading me down the road and eventually working with the then dean of students. Eventually, Lynn was told about an important discovery that Paul Cronin had made. Just as Lynn had arrived at Sweetbriar in 2001, Mr. Cronin had retired after 33 years as director of the equestrian program, so they didn't actually meet. But during a recent phone call, Paul explained to me exactly how he became aware of the enslaved cemetery's existence. He and his students were beagling one afternoon with his pack by the upper lake on campus. He heard the cries of a beagle from the wooded area to the right of the lake, so he followed it in. After walking a short distance through the woods, he came to a large patch of briars where the crying beagle was stuck, and while making his way through the briars to free the hound, he noticed peculiar rows of stones that looked as if they had been purposely placed. So he returned another day with tools to hack away the briars for a better look. He was certain he had discovered a cemetery, though there were no names inscribed on the stones. Paul stresses that no one would have casually walked or ridden by to ignore those stones. It is safe to say that for probably decades in the 20th century, the memory of that site, that it existed, let alone where it was, had faded from the public consciousness. But Paul was trying to protect the site and... At that point, the dean of students, Valdry Walker, she was not only an African-American woman, but she was from Nelson County. So she also knew local history. And Valdry knew of my interest in historic cemeteries. So she and I started working together to try to locate descendants because we were hoping that we could locate folks who could tell us more about the site. We assumed that at least some of the enslaved individuals took the last name of Elijah Fletcher, which, although it does happen, it does not happen the way people think. It's not like 100% of the time. In fact, in Virginia, maybe 20% of the time. Uh, and then 
Valerie went to the phone book and she started cold calling Fletchers. <laughs> and sure enough, we reached a Fletcher who was also a descendant and who was also within his family, you know, the equivalent of an elder. Jasper, Eddie, his nickname, the Reverend Fletcher, I mean, he was born and raised in Amherst, but then he had gone off to serve in the army um, and then had returned and served as a sheriff and, and in other jobs ever since in Amherst. I mean, he had story. He had been told stories. He remembered stories. He told us stories. So we were just very fortunate that all those pieces came together. And then I spent a couple of years, including with other archaeological colleagues in, in the region, to ask them, including my, my colleagues up in Monticello. And so to ask them, how do you preserve these sites? What should I be looking for? What, you know, what questions can we ask? What, what resources? Even now, there's not like a guidebook to how to study these sacred sites. Uh, but it, certainly the critical step is to recognize that they're there, to figure out the perimeter where there are human remains so that they can be protected from any vandalism or unintentional or intentional destruction. For 10 years, Lynn researched the names of the 155 enslaved men, women, and children listed in the will of Sweetbar Plantation owner Elijah Fletcher. When she had concluded her research, she estimated that about a quarter to a third of Sweetbar support employees who are African American and or of Monacan ancestry were descended from the enslaved community. That estimate is accurate as of about 2015. So I was researching the burial ground, but as you know, none of the stones had any names or dates on them. So there's never been a moment where I could prove conclusively any specific person who's buried in the burial ground, not one name. I was never going to excavate human remains at that site. And, and in fact, to this day, I always recommend if people ask or if other people might be interested that I don't think that is the right route to pursue. The only real reason to excavate remains at this point uh, would be to try to collect DNA. But there's a lot of misunderstanding about what DNA can and cannot tell you. And you would have to start having connections with descendants anyhow. So instead, I, I worked backwards to on the eve of the Civil War, there were 155 men, women, and children enslaved at Sweet Bar. And I started studying that community. And it was out of that genealogical research into those 155 people and, you know, thousands and thousands of descendants, and then specifically tracing descendants who not only who still worked at Sweet Bar, but in turn whose families had worked here for generations. And Dorothy Sales is a classic example of that. Dorothy was, you know, a fundamental part of the institution for half a century. She was born in the house right behind the president's house, the cabin that was originally a, a cabin for enslaved families and then had all sorts of different uses after that. And, and so Dorothy's father was Sterling Jones and her mother was Aurelia. Her father worked at Sweetbriar for decades. In fact, Sterling Jones is one of the individuals who made the bricks used to build Sweetbriar College's buildings. He was not born enslaved, but his parents were. At the very least, his father. The record gets a little bit difficult to follow. And Dorothy started working for the college when she was a young girl living on campus. Uh, when she was a teenager, she started helping one of the professors wash bottles in the chemistry laboratory. And then eventually, she, she just kept taking on more and more responsibilities. And so as you just mentioned, she ended up working in the bookstore for decades. She was training people there. And uh, she won, and I, th I want to say it was in 1988, the Virginia College Store Association named her Employee of the Year. Um, so recognized for her skills, not just at Sweet Bar, but uh, statewide. And uh, the class of 1994 nominated her as an honorary member of their class. And that was the year that she retired. And in 2003, the college named the education building, which had originally been the bookshop, in memory of Dorothy Sales. So I had a chance to speak with her, uh, you know, several years later and actually just uh, the year before she died. Dr. Rainville's interview tape with Dorothy Sales has been found and digitized for use in this episode. We'll listen to a portion of it in part two of episode five, researching the palimpsest of Sweet Bar's history. Student Ashanti Brown also shares an interview that she conducted with her grandmother. 
and Dr. Wall shares her perspectives of being the only black faculty member and how listening to one another is imperative for moving forward together. <laughs>